Having trouble with those hard to shift stains? Then you need new reindeer rib. Its four antler shaped bristles effortlessly penetrate into those hard to reach nooks and crannies of your toilet bowl. It's a finish so clean you'll eat your dinner off it. I know I will. Today, you all know me as the calm, reassuring voice of laboratory hygiene. In his life, a man may play many parts. And I know how to play those parts. I play with my parts often. Versatile actor that I am, I have indeed played many parts in my long and distinguished career. One of the most celebrated roles, especially amongst those who celebrate such roles, is my small but pivotal role in the 1974 classic The Vanity Project. The film had star quality pouring out of every orifice. Uh, as a young, though admittedly already fully formed actor, I could not help but absorb some of the magic to embellish uh, my own uh, intimate talent. The, the film's unique and daring blend of science fiction, gothic horror, gritty western, sharks and softcore eroticism left baffled audiences, uh, well, baffled to be honest. On its release, it was almost universally reviled by critics and the cinema goes alike uh, the public just didn't get it but 40 years on in our multimedia genre bending world we can see it for its visionary masterpiece that i think it is but don't just take my word for it the men and women who were there alongside me during its genesis gestation and birthing into an unprepared and hostile world can explain it almost as equi- 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 as well as i can Men and women such as screen legend and professional cockney Sir Darwin Lambeth. Well, as I recall, and my recollections are good, because as an actor, you need a good memory. It comes in right handy when you have to remember your, uh, your what you call it, thingamajig, blooming lines, any road up. I recall how one day, me and the missus, Vianetta, were having a spot of lunch out at Oliver Ruddle's Surrey Mansion, done filming. And Ollie says to me, he says, Darwin... Darwin, he says, because I'm so good, he had to name me twice. Darwin, 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 Darwin. I said, get to the blooming point, Ollie. So then he says, Darwin, I've been thinking. And he didn't do that very often. And then blow me if he didn't say how he'd been thinking, what if all of us actor mates, me, him, Peter O'Lush, the two Richards, Bourbon and Ginger, Trevor and Brian Shouty made our own film. So I said to him, Ollie, I said, Ollie, give me three good reasons why I should come on board. And he said, complete artistic freedom, the joy of teamwork and a massive tax loss. Well, now, I didn't need asking twice, but Ollie being Ollie, he asked me twice anyway. But what was a fitting subject for such an ambitious undertaking? At the time, there was a lot of interest in alien life forms. There was a glam rock star, David Elbow, who was asking if you could have Nookie on Saturn. Uh, David von Heikenberg's famous best-selling book, Ford Cortina of the Gods, and the television science fiction show, The Clangers. So it was inevitable that the Vanity Project would eventually blast off into the outer reaches of space itself. But its beginning began more closely to home, the partial home of actor and hellraiser, Oliver Ruddles, to be precise, and one sleepless night when he found himself wide awake in a dream. Obviously, though, he was asleep because uh, he was dreaming. Uh, Ollie himself takes up the story. The great civil rights leader Martin Luther King had a dream, a dream of racial equality and an end to prejudice. I also had a dream, but my dream was a bit different. My dream basically consists of me and dozens of beautiful women, stark naked. Well, stark and naked anyway. And I thought to myself, what would make it a nightmare was if it was just me standing there, Starkers. That's right, I had imagined another world altogether. A world without beautiful birds standing around in the nutty. And I thought to myself, Ollie, old boy, you can't let that happen. No way, Pedro. If the world was under threat of losing its fittest birds, I'd build my own spaceship out of, uh, out of leftover beer cans or something. Because in those days, and let's be honest, in these days, there's never any shortage of beer cans around my house. So anyway, I decided should this nightmare become a reality, I would flee the Earth in my beer can metallic rocket 
not forgetting naturally to take all the beautiful nudie women with me. So you see, the vanity project was a dream concept. Quite literally, since I'd had the concept in a dream. Or was it a nightmare? Sometimes when it looked like the film would never be finished, it was like a living nightmare, but also like being wide awake in a dream. But the important thing was, my dream nightmare was being turned into a film. Of course, in my version, the one in my head, they were all in the buff, the women, and in the film they weren't. Well, some of them were, some of the time. As a wise man once said, you can have all of the birds naked some of the time, some of the birds naked all of the time, but sadly you can't have all of them all of the time. Though it wasn't for one of trying. Still, I said to myself, Ollie, old chap, this is definitely a concept worth exploring. Indeed it was. A dream concept to end all dream concepts. But who could be entrusted with the challenging task of translating Oliver Ruddle's red-hot vision into a blueprint for the silver screen? Hmm... Well, then, of course, came the question of who was going to write the blooming thing. And when Ollie asked me for advice on the matter, the first name that popped into my head was, of course, the great playwright, Harold Pauser. In them days, Harold was just coming off the back of success with his fabulous and groundbreaking work, The Tupperware Party. And he seemed to me the right man for the job. Plus, he was cheaper than getting one of those Hollywood blokes in. So we got Harold on board. We weren't sure how he'd adapt to film because the stage was really his platform back then. He used a lot of new theatrical techniques in his writing, along, of course, with the great Irish playwright Samuel Bucket. Critics lumped his work in with the theatre of the absurd, but the way Harold liked to describe it was theatre of the unheard. See, he was influenced by the avant-garde jazz musicians of the time. There was Miles in America, Kilometres in France, and Mrs Mills here in England. What they was all saying was how it was the notes they didn't play what counted. So for Harold, the words he didn't use were the most important words in his script. As illustrated superbly in this next clip, which for me shows Harold it is blooming brilliant best. Well, what more can you say? It was like the words just leapt off the page, which in fact... They did. It was only three months into filming that Harold turned up and said he'd sent Ollie a sheet of blank paper by mistake. But not to worry, because he found the script, which was a shame really, because it was rubbish. 